to another edition of the Sight and Insight podcast with me, Judy Curtis, and the lovely uh, Law Wing Nagel and David P. Curtis. Uh, and we're going to be talking about drawing and uh, and painting and which uh, which comes first. But before that, I just want to share this with you. Do you like that? That's uh, my birthday card from my son and his wife, Noah and Margaret. And I just wanted to share that with you because I thought it was kind of cute. There I am, another year older, uh, but not much wiser. But enough of uh, my problems. Let's jump right in with our question of the day, which is, is it drawing or painting first? What does drawing mean uh, in terms of, of painting? Uh, and I just wanted to start off with an anecdote because I thought it was interesting that uh, the artist Polythea Starr, who we did a big show on at uh, Rockport Art Association and Museum uh, a couple of years ago, uh, when she first started at the Boston Museum School, she did a whole year of studying drawing, cast drawing, anatomy, uh, life drawing with um, Philip Hale. Uh, and she did very well. She was an excellent uh, drafts person. Uh, she'd always drawn as a child, so she had a, a good idea of uh, what to do and how to do it. But when it came to her second year, she graduated to studying painting with Leslie Thompson. And she was completely out of her depth. She had no idea how to mix colour. She had no concept of what colour could do. Uh, and she suddenly finds that she's having to create paintings with you know this gooey substance that she's got to mix and then put on the canvas she didn't know how to control the paint she knew nothing about it uh, and when she asked Leslie Thompson for help apparently she felt that uh, all he was telling was well go and, and just do it just try it experiment with it and see what you can do and in fact uh, Polly Thayer is the only person I know who actually dropped out of the museum school everybody else was trying to get in she dropped out after a year and a semester because she had no concept of what painting was about. She, she had all the drawing theory, but painting, she, it, she, it was difficult for her to make that transition from, from graphics to, to painting. So David, I'm going to ask you first, because I know you were sort of taught in this Boston School method. Do you think it's right or wrong to uh, to teach an artist? You can only use black and white to begin with. You've got to be able to do a cast drawing, learn these basics, and then suddenly you've turned loose with paint and you have to... It must be a completely different way of thinking. Do you think that's the right way to go about it? Well, I, 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 I harken back to what Harold Speed talks about, because I think he talks on the subject of the important modern day importance of an academic tradition, which might we could say started in the 19th, early 19th century and worked its way up uh, from, from David uh, to uh, Bouguereau to Jerome, uh, to all the great um, uh, Glier, all the great academic painters uh, in the French tradition. And they basically started off with this concept of cast drawing which I think is sort of reformed and rekindled today as the solid method of doing it. So you would learn, as I did at 18, you would learn uh, how to use a line and to form an outline around the figure. And as Speed talks about, it is just a, a configuration. It's not a fact. There is Nobody walks around with a line wrapped around their head. It's, uh, it's two masses coming together is the best explanation. So in a sense, I could understand Polly uh, Thayer's uh, problems, um, uh, Polly Starr's problems, is, is that once you pick up this brush, you no longer have the sharp pointed implement to do your very, very fine detail. Uh, but instead, here's a uh, one-inch brush, and usually the teacher loves to give you a big fat brush so that you make a mistake. <laughs> one of the, and this shows you this the, the sort of irony behind this is one of the things we would do. Uh, they did to me as a student starting off when I got a chance to do my first still life. It was always a senior student that would come along and say, "Hey." 
try it with a cast in it because you've graduated from painting, from drawing cast. Now you can paint a cast. <laughs> well, they knew the problem was in paint, you can't reproduce the light of that cast in a painting. So they laugh through the whole thing. And then in the end, they tell you, that was the worst thing you could have done is to put a cast in a painting. Yeah. So it's a sort, it's, sort of painterly hazing? <laughs> it, it, it is a painterly <laughs> hazing. But it also is the irony of which you took the topic of conversation here is that maybe, uh, maybe the cast should be forgotten and you pick up a brush and you just start painting. Yeah. So I don't know. I but I think the academic, sorry, yeah. uh, follow up. I think the academic tradition is solid. I think drawing first is a great way of understanding this. Uh, there is that problem of working into something. Uh, so I disagree. <laughs> what? Yeah. Oh, we have I disagree <laughs> with that entirely. I don't think that drawing uh, needs to come first before painting. And uh, I know you may be okay. looking at me okay. shocked. The, the gloves are off, folks. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that painting is a completely different discipline than drawing. And I think that you can draw well and still, as we saw with Polly Thayer Star, uh, not be able to pick up a brush and be able to mix the colors and put the put the colors onto the canvas in a way that's satisfying to you. Uh, I think that uh, that painting requires uh, a, a study of design and color, and I think that you need to go out and and be involved with the palette, with the brush, and if it's in plain air, you're outdoors doing it, and I think that. Uh, that a person can go in there who's completely uh, devoid of any schooling around the David method, pardon me, uh, <laughs> and, and the Boston School, they don't need that. Well, what, one of the things that happened at the Boston School when Tarbell and Benson sort of were the heads of it, I think it was around 1913, I think the museum... This is the Boston Museum School wanted to administrate the teaching or the subject matter of the courses. And uh, Tarbell and Benson saw the, the flags went up, that this was going to be a problem. So they actually uh, left in mass uh, those, those fine, fine painters. Uh, they ended up forming the Guild of Boston Artists right around 1914, right around that time. So the Guild is interesting that it was formed... Uh, with that idea in mind, and I, I think originally it was sort with of... With the idea of painting first. Uh, oh, painting oh, oh. as a separate entity to drawing. And I think that yeah. th there is some confusion with when we specifically talk about the Boston School, mm -hmm. because they did start off with this academic tradition. Philip Hale taught a great drawing course, figure drawing, um, and everybody I've known who has ever... Uh, mentioned had studied with Philip Hale, they, they just praised him. Uh, so he must have been a very great man and a very gentle soul. Uh, but And that might have helped the course. Um, but drawing Cass, uh, remember my, my teacher Ives Gamel, that was the first thing I had to do was to learn to, we did line drawings of the figures in the afternoon and I'd work on my cast in the morning. And I was not allowed to go near paint. So I think the first painting I did was a landscape in Williamstown. Um, that was a good, you know, all, not a full year away, but it was probably another, it was probably, you know, six to eight months away before I could pick up paint. But I had painted before. Mm -hmm. So I had a little slight advantage. I wasn't just thrown in at the deep end with charcoal drawings and, and pencils having this beautiful... Uh, hard edge line to do. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think the academic, and it's very popular today. I see a lot of uh, online courses. Uh, Charles Barg has made a, mm -hmm. a strong comeback. Jerome's uh, um, man for drawing. The, the Gamble defined that too, that there were two methods of learning to draw. And this is one of the things I think Speed brings this up, that there's a sculptural way of drawing, which is like a sculpture would find angles and then and then find the shape. Uh, Ives believed more, he called it the potato shape. 
meaning that you come close to what you think the shape is, and then you make it more like, mm -hmm. which is a lot more like a way a painter thinks mm -hmm. rather than a sculptor. Mm -hmm. So I, there is that difference, Connie. I, I would admit mm -hmm. that. But I think how would somebody start off, how would you start off a student then uh, to, to, he wants to learn to paint and he's serious, he's a young person, uh, let's say you've known him for years and he's 16 or 17, aren't you going to say draw first? No, I'm not. <laughs> uh, so, so if it was, if he was my student, I would, I would take him outdoors because that's my uh, modus operandi, I guess. <laughs> you know, and um, and I think also it's very um, speak. It, there's a lot of movement, gesture, um, as opposed to doing still lifes in the studio. Um, I would take them outside. I'd have them set up and then I would have them do a design. A a line in design is one of the ways in which we've described it, but it's a gestural movement. Uh, it would be like if you were in life drawing, there used to be gesture drawing and um, and somebody would put their pencil onto the paper and instead of looking at the paper, you would look at the model and you would draw without looking at your paper. Well, I would take that same technique and have them gesture a line that they see out in nature and then put spots of color around that. So so I believe that, that a person could develop a very fine painting uh, through this method and and not through a, an academic drawing method. Mm -hmm. I, I can understand your point of view. And, and Speed does talk about the modern problems of conventionality in, in academia. And one of the problems we see is that uh, a lot of the teaching going on today is just that, is just painting. So because they've been starved of this drawing concept, and when we look at some of the American Impressionists, we're very, uh, we, we feel that there's a lot of drawing involved. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think partly you're right. I think there's a lot of understanding of color and design in turning form with painting. Um, I think in the conclusion of Speed's chapter on this, this idea of uh, academia versus mm -hmm. you know, drawing first versus painting first, I think he, he, he sums it up kind of uh, interesting in that uh, maybe it would you agree to this, that if it was started indoors, that maybe they could draw, mm. you know, using line and understanding line, what line can do, but also, too, maybe they should pick up paints in the beginning and not be held back. No, you can't, uh, you know, I like Polly Starr um, was held back from painting uh, because she, that was their course. They were dogmented uh, right. into thinking that you have to draw before you see. And I think, I understand parts of this academia, And but my son, I have two boys, uh, one went off to art school, but he loved to draw. Mm -hmm. and, and he's now uh, involved in... Uh, um, what do you call it, um, drawing graphic, graphic novels. Because he, a little bit of Judy, a little bit of me, he likes to draw, mm -hmm. but he loves to write imaginative stories. And um, I, 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 I've encouraged that. So that's a whole, I think so, you're right in that. I'll admit you're right in that respect that they're two different disciplines mm -hmm. and maybe there's no overlapping of the two. I think that academic drawing is necessary to the artist in like doing scales for a musician. I think it's a way that trains his power of observation, but but to overemphasize that would be to the detriment of a painter. I think that painters um, uh, and getting stuck in that would would uh, prevent them from producing or introducing the feeling nature that paintings so often give us and that you don't get through drawings. Well, I, I, one of the courses uh, that you know I had there too was a day came and I was asked to copy an old master. It's very similar to the what they do in the bar system with cast, drawing, copying old masters. And I thought I chose a real good drawing by Raphael. It was a many thing, many parts of the body, the torso, the arm, the hand, the head, all different on one page. 
and I thought this would be interesting to draw. Well, I couldn't get anywhere with it. And the senior student came over to me and says, well, trace it. I said, oh, trace it. No, that's, that's bad. That's cheating. He said, no, 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 no. Trace it. Trace it, Dave. You'll see. And as soon as I traced it, I understood what he did, which was he wasn't being accurate about the muscles. He was overstating it slightly, just enough to make it look real. But he had overstated enough to say, look at the variety of this line. And that's when, when I traced it, I understood what he did. And maybe that's a better way of teaching this yeah. is for if I had a, if I had a son again who come along, I would just give him Leonardo's, Michelangelo's, uh, Raphael's, Titian's. And I'd say, just trace all these drawings. Just keep on tracing, trace and trace and trace. Because there's, I think what you're saying is drawing maybe just boiling down to when you're starting to paint. It's just it's just about proportion of things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, One thing and, in relation yeah. to the other. And being able to really observe what you see out there. Right. As Versus. opposed to, yeah. And and the other thing is that um, prior to this we were talking about some aspects of originality and that originality is concerned with sincerity or or as David often says, can you get away with something, you know, in your painting? And um, meaning that if you overstate, let's say, the tree trunk or the or the flower, is it an overstatement that is sincere and uh, and is believable, and also maybe even produces a feeling nature uh, to to the piece that would not occur if you were so caught up in the accurate de- drawing of this piece uh, to the point that it maybe makes the the whole uh, painting lifeless. Yes, there, there's a lot of, I mean, that was true of the academic tradition and probably one of the main reasons for the re- revolution of uh, uh, modernism, uh, you know, express yourself and, and all that and, yeah. was because of the staid looking uh, academic work that uh, was being produced at the time. I think there were some schools, though, that sort of varied from that. I think some of the German schools, some of our gre- best uh, 19th, 20th century painters were ones who didn't go to the French schools, but actually went to the German schools. And mm-hmm. I, I think of Lord Leighton, mm-hmm. Frederick Leighton, uh, ma- amazing draftsman, yet uh, I don't think he was taught in that s- a, sli- a slightly different method than the French were using, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, a little more a la prima, uh, very tonal, mm-hmm. uh, but it's interesting. The, the painters, I think of, uh, uh, I was just looking, I'm uh, writing a little piece on Frederick Lee. Uh, Robinson Lee, the great uh, Western painter. And he spent like uh, 12 dozen years at uh, uh, Mu- Munich t- uh, learning to learning to paint. Uh, and they weren't considered colorists, but boy, when you look at uh, Robinson Lee's uh, color work in his landscapes, it's amazing. It's amazing. Wow. Yeah. Okay, well, I hate to interject at this point. I haven't been able to get a word in these two. We're so excited about the topic. Um, But uh, I just want to leave you with this uh, thought as we draw to a close here that it's a quote from Cezanne and his opinion was that drawing and colour are not separate at all insofar as you paint, you draw. The more the colour harmonises, the more exact the drawing becomes. So I thought that was kind of interesting and he feels that, you know, these two go hand in hand. And you mentioned, Connie, about um, the the fact that you need perhaps a sense of proportion from a drawing point of view if you're painting. And I I was wondering about that, that maybe you don't need to have a year's training in uh, in the bag method before you actually pick up a paintbrush, but perhaps some idea of perspective or, um, you know, the proportion of things so that you can, you know, if you're trying to draw... You know, a boat, I know you're not supposed to think about drawing a boat, you're drawing a shape, it's an object, the light hitting the object. But perhaps if you have um, a sense of how proportions work, maybe maybe you need some drawing um, background. But mm. maybe once you've learned to draw, maybe you just need a good teacher who can take you the next step using paint and colour. And maybe that's all it is, is that folks who have uh, some drawing background and want to become 
take their artistry further just need to sign up for a site and insight workshop <laughs> <laughs> that's a good um i was just going to quickly respond to your mm-hmm. Cezanne quote because um I think he's melding the two. Yes. He's saying um, know how to draw, know proportions, or, uh, and yet do it also through color. Mm. And, uh, and that is our emphasis in, in Sight and Insight. We are focusing on uh, creating form, turning the form actually through color. Yeah. And it's it's old. This is an old method. At the same time, it's not being uh, taught and utilized as much today as it as it has been in the past. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, thank well, you. I think the oh, you the, to reply to the that? last <laughs> quote uh, is um, is realism is everywhere, but there's no life in it, and that's Harold Speed. And I think there realism is realism in painting. Realism in painting. I think there's a little too much of that today, and I really fear the uh, the problem of photography uh, in in it. And and the sad part is we we, we just recently saw our, uh, a presidential portrait, um, and uh, and it, I didn't think it stood up to some of the portraits of the past. But that's neither here nor there. That's uh, that maybe that's politics. I don't know. But it's it's that understanding of how things, um, what we are caught up in this realism. That so the portrait artists even today are, are having to depend on photography, mm-hmm. and I think that that's not only a dis. It's dis. I mean, it's it's not accurate color wise, and it's definitely not accurate uh, with proportions and drawings. It's slightly distorted. Yeah. And uh, and I think we could get caught up in too much realism, and I think Speed's right. There's a lack of life. So in that sense, I I sort of uh, agree with Connie, and I think she's got a strong feeling for this idea of if you want to be a painter, pick up brush and paint. Right. Yeah. Not a piece of charcoal. I, so. sounds, yes. That sounds good. And on that note, folks, we're going to uh, bid you a hearty adieu. Uh, hope you're ready to go out painting. I know Connie and David are going to be out there. So until next week, thank you for listening. Mm-hmm.